Blizzard Beast by Wheeler and Tabanez. We had been feeding a feral cat outside our house all winter that year. It was a particularly hard New Jersey winter with many significant snowfalls, weeks on end of frigid winds and long stretches of sub-freezing temperatures. We had cats of our own, so feeding the outside kitty seemed like the natural thing to do. We built a small heated shelter off the back of our garage for him to sleep and fed him at the same time of day that we gave food to our indoor cats. We called the outside cat Count Dracula because of his thick cloak-like mane of black hair and his piercing yellow eyes. He had become accustomed to the presence of my mother and I, but no matter how often we tried to tempt him with food, we couldn't lure him inside our warm home. We would have gladly matriculated him into the mix with our two middle-aged brown tabbies, but Dracula was feral to his bones. He tolerated our presence in the yard, but would not cross the threshold into the warmth, despite our frequent invitations. Just as we began to let ourselves believe that the bad winter would soon be over, the Count abruptly disappeared. He was known to wander about the backyards of the neighborhood, but it had long become routine for him to show up at dawn for his breakfast and reappear every evening at dusk to eat his plate of food before hunkering down for the night. My mother was the first to notice his absence in the morning when she was preparing me a school lunch and serving breakfast. Dracula didn't show up for his food this morning, she told me, as she slid scrambled eggs onto my plate. At age eight, this news didn't register it as an alarming fact the way it might now, having known a lifetime of pain and loss. When mom picked me up from school that day, she seemed distracted and melancholy. She was worried about the cat. When we got home, she had me go upstairs and change into my snowsuit, and then she helped me on with my wool hat, mittens, and rubber snow boots. We stepped out the sliding glass door onto our back deck, which was buried under several feet of drift. There was a thin path, only the width of a snow shovel, leading to the stairs. Stepping off the deck, onto the crust of the snow, my mom's feet broke through, but I was light enough to walk right on top. Even with the approach of slightly warmer weather, the backyard was a frozen, crystallized dreamland, dripping with ice facets that shimmered orange in the late afternoon sunlight. I shoveled lightly across the snow, instinctively distributing my weight so I wouldn't break through. My mother lagged behind in the deep drifts, hopelessly bogged down. I'm not going to be able to get through this snow, she called. You're going to have to look for the cat. Why don't you start over there at the fence? Try to get a look behind those bushes over there. See if you can see any sign of him. I followed my mother's instructions, real concern starting to well up inside me for Count Dracula. Amidst this concern was also a fear that behind those bushes, curled up in a ball, I might find the cat frozen stiff. Cautiously, I shuffled over to the bushes by the fence and peeked my head behind the icy leaves. To my relief, there wasn't any animal there. After reporting this to my mother, she instructed me to follow the perimeter of the fence, checking behind all the bushes and snowdrifts to see if there was any sign of him. Following the fence, I carefully examined every nook and cranny where an injured cat might hide, but didn't encounter anything. When I got closer to the house, not ten feet from where my mother was still standing up to her waist in snow, I used my gloved hand to push back a snow-glazed pricker bush and suddenly called out in a prepubescent high-pitched scream, I found him! My mother waded the distance through the high snow, plowing through the crust as it shattered in her wake. When she reached me, I was still standing in the slippery ice rind, holding back the prickers so she could look in at the black matted fur, half frozen into the crust. Seeing the body, which was still noticeably breathing, my mother let out a gasp. She started to bend over in order to pick up the cat, but at the last second seemed to hesitate. She withdrew a little bit and stood looking curiously at the wounded animal. I too was looking closely at the mass of fur laid out in the snow. There was something not quite right about the shape of the animal, something weird and unnatural about the way it was displayed on the snow. I asked my mom, Is that the count? I'm not quite sure it's a cat. She didn't reply at first and just stood there, staring down at the animal with worry written across her face. When she did reply, it was without uncertainty, as if she had suddenly made up her mind. Of course it's Dracula. Who else could it be? We have to get him inside. With that, she bent down and gently began peeling the matted fur off the ice. 
As she was pulling it from the crust, I had a chance to look at the black wad of fur and was filled with a queasy, lightheaded feeling. As it became unstuck from the snow, a chill went up my spine that had nothing to do with the cold. I stood there in the bleak winter wind looking at my sad, graying mother, holding the sick animal in her arms, and couldn't help but ask her again, Are you sure that's a cat? Of course I'm sure, she snapped. Let's go inside. I stepped down off the ice crust and followed in her tracks as she moved through the snow trail that she had already broken, leading us back into our warm house. We shook off our boots in the mudroom, and she went directly into the downstairs bathroom, instructing me to fetch some blankets and towels from the linen closet so she could make the cat comfortable and get him warmed up before taking him to the vet. I obediently ran upstairs and fetched the items, bringing them back downstairs and yelling to my mother that I had the towels ready. She called out, He's just starting to wake up, so I want to keep a firm grip on him. I'm going to open the door a crack and you can pass in the towels. With this, the door opened just wide enough for me to hand her the linens, promptly closing once the exchange was completed. Through the wooden door, I could hear her arranging a makeshift cat bed with one hand while she spoke softly to the bundle in her arms. At this point, my two indoor cats wandered over to the bathroom door and were standing at stiff attention with their tails fully puffed up as if they sensed the presence of another animal in the house. I could hear my mother talking softly to the creature in her arms, and then I heard another noise come through the door that sounded like a muffled roar, almost like a rumble of a lion on a nature show. My mother nervously exclaimed, Oh my! And at the same moment, the two indoor cats took off running in sheer terror. I heard my mother let out another gasp, saying, Oh my God! I asked her what was going on in there, and instead of a reply, she let out a loud shriek. Then the attack began. It didn't last long. The muffled roar I heard from inside the bathroom now became a hissing, screaming, raging howl, mixed in with my mother's desperate pleas for God's mercy. I rattled the door, but my mother's weight must have been pressed against it, because despite the terrible noises coming from within, I was unable to come to her aid. Inside the bathroom, the sounds of struggle became even more violent the door booming and crashing against its frame as my mother struggled inside with the crazed animal. Her agonized shrieking came to a frightful climax and then abruptly stopped as if she had been suddenly unplugged. I stood banging on the door with my small fist, crying and screaming myself sick. Inside the bathroom, the roaring and hissing had subsided and there presently came a distinct sucking and chewing sound. I continued struggling with the door in a frantic attempt to get to my mother but it was held tight from within. Finally, after a prolonged period of nauseating lapping sounds, I was able to partially push open the door. The instant the door began to swing inwards, it was ripped from my hands and flung wide, toppling me forward into the tiny bathroom. I found myself face to face with a black, semi-humanoid beast of matted fur perched atop my mother's eviscerated corpse. The thing was impossibly larger than a feral cat, and considerably bigger than the lump of fur my mother had so innocently brought into our home. This was no cat at all. As it glared at me with iridescent yellow eyes, I became aware of its bloody mouth full of rapier teeth. I looked down at where its front legs should have been and saw the monster was equipped with glimmering, five-fingered claws protruding from tightly muscled forearms. In an instant it was on me, tackling me to the ground and crushing me under its impossible weight. It seemed to be growing larger even as it pinned me to the floor. I felt its hot breath on my face as I cringed in panic with my eyes closed. Then, horror of horrors, I felt those terrible teeth bite into my face, the razor canine slicing through my eyelids and puncturing my delicate orbs. I was past screaming now as the beast began probing my face with its long tongue, lapping at the juice from the deflated eyeballs and sucking at the blood pouring from the wounds. I must have passed out around them because I woke many months later in a hospital where I have been a ward of the state for the past 30 years. The doctors and staff of this hospital say there was no black matted beast. They say the black feral cat that my mother and I called Count Dracula never disappeared at all and that he was frequently seen about my old neighborhood for years until he eventually passed away. They say that at the age of eight years old I killed my beloved mother, ate her eyes, drank her blood, and then ripped out my own eyeballs with my bare hands. Nonsense! The doctors and staff have told me many things, but I don't believe them, and neither should you. There are monsters out there in the snow that will trick you into taking them inside. They use feral cat colonies to lure their prey, which are almost always compassionate mothers and their children. 
They love to taste human blood and have a particular hankering for innocent young eyeballs that have not yet seen the horrors of life. I keep warning people about these blizzard beasts, but very few will listen, and of those who do take the time to hear my story, none believe. That was the final day of my mother's life and the last time I would ever have the use of my vision. The very last image I retained into my brain was the black matted demon sitting atop my mother's shredded corpse, her obscenely bloodied white skin crushed beneath the hairy weight of the beast. I see it before me now. I have told this story consistently without alteration of details since regaining consciousness thirty years ago, but no matter how convincing my tale may be, it has done me no favors except to render me unfit to stand trial. My only comfort on this cold and lonely ward is the hospital's cat, which I have been told is all black with piercing yellow eyes. His name is Thomas, which I find to be absurd. Although the medical staff strictly forbids it, I secretly refer to the cat as Count Dracula. He comes to visit me often, especially when the weather gets cold. On these long, frigid nights when I lay shivering in my bed, he creeps into my padded cell and curls up in the folds of my straitjacket to keep me warm. Despite the dangers, I still love cats.